we have come now to the end of the story, and it's this talk to this morning is all about heaven. The end of the story is happily ever after. And so I want to want to talk to you a little bit about what the Lord has shown me about heaven uh, over a lifetime, and uh, hopefully that will encourage many of you as as well as it's uh, as much as it's encouraged me. So let's begin with uh, prayer, if we might. Father, we thank you for that amazing gift that you so love the world, that you gave us your only begotten Son, our Savior. We thank you for Jesus, the love that saved us, and the love that promises that we will be everlastingly with him. We thank you that he is even now preparing a place for us. And the confidence that we have that if he's preparing a place, he will surely come again to receive us unto himself. And we long for that glorious city where the light is the Lamb, where there is no no longer any darkness. There is nothing that bites or devours. There are no tears, no suffering, no sorrow, no Satan, no temptation, and no death. We thank you for the hope of heaven. We ask that your spirit would encourage our hearts this morning as we, as Paul commanded, lift our, th- lift our minds above and place our heart in the city that you are preparing. Grant us visions of glory, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to invite you to dream with me for a minute about what heaven will be like. And sometimes I, I think if you've uh, ever been to Yosemite, any of you have been to Yosemite? Or maybe there are grander places in the world that you've seen. Uh, my favorite place that I've seen are the Dolomite Alps between Austria and uh, Italy. Breathtaking vistas of beauty. And how would you describe these glorious, the magnificence of Niagara or the Grand Canyon, how would you describe these to a fetus in the womb? Um, I sometimes think that that must be, that may be an example, an illustration of, of our trying to imagine what heaven is like because Paul says you can't do it. There's no words uh, given to us to imagine these things, and yet we know it's glory. It's glorious to be with the Savior. Can you imagine the first time you see the Lord and are embraced um, by nail-pierced hands? Uh, What kind of glory will that be? But as I think about it, the Bible has an awful lot to say about heaven, and so there are intimations. I understand that, but their significance. We put our hearts in heaven because that gives us the hope that enables us by the Spirit of God to persevere through the sufferings of this life. It is that hope of the glory that God has set before us that enables us to endure um, suffering in this life in hope of glory. There are numbers of pictures. Let me just uh, take you through the Bible quickly to, um, to to get some of these ideas of pictures. Of course, there's a beautiful picture in Genesis chapter 2 of the tree of life. And we all want to participate in partaking of the tree of life that was forbidden to man, but the glory that God built into Eden. It says the Lord planted the garden of Eden. And you can see, if you go, you see the animals, you go to the zoo, or you see all the plants, and you begin to understand something of the imagination of God. How could he make these creatures of such beauty? Uh, What kind of an imagination does he have that even in a fallen world uh, where the earth is actually cursed, which is the world in which we live, yet such beauty still uh, comes before us? One of the most striking pictures, I think, of heaven in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 45. You You will remember that story about how Joseph's brothers uh, betrayed him, uh, sold him, uh, were thinking of killing him, but finally they sold him for silver. 
uh, down to Egypt, which is as good as, as killing him. And uh, of course he was there and God intended all of that evil of the brethren to be good. God purposed it and God used Joseph to save uh, that holy family from the famine. And in one of the most dramatic passages of all of scripture, you remember when Joseph's brothers come down, he knew he would see them because God had given him a dream that they would bow before him. So he was watching for that. He places himself as selling grain to all the nations because he's looking for his brothers, uh, not to punish them, but to preserve life. And he, he does not reveal himself to them until he knows that they have love for one another and he puts them through these various tests. And when he sees that they really do love one another, he recognizes that God has saved them. And that, at that point, then, he reveals himself to his brothers. And the way he does it, he has this masquerade. You remember, he appears to be this harsh, arbitrary, and cruel Egyptian official speaks through a translator and all of that. Well, anyway, when, he, when, when Judah says that he will stand surety for his brother, Judah the one who sold him for the 20 pieces of silver, it's at that point that he reveals himself. He commands everyone to go out. And you know, the brothers are wondering if they're going to be killed by him or what, what he's really up to. And uh, they're ridden with guilt and he commands everyone to go out. And then he says, I am Joseph. My goodness, and they all fall back. Imagine the drama of that. I am your brother Joseph. And um, anyway, then he tells them to come near. And I imagine that as an embrace in full forgiveness. Joseph with his brothers. And um, once I was teaching this out at uh, Calvary Chapel, uh, did the same thing actually, I taught it in Korea, but I asked 12, I asked 11 men to come up. And I said, uh, come up here. And uh, I said, I want us all to embrace like this. Very visual. The, the fellows from Calvary were the Calvary House ministry they have for people who are coming out of addictions, who've confessed faith, but they have uh, dramatic pasts of sin, and so uh, Calvary has a wonderful ministry uh, to these uh, former addicts. And so I had them, I said, you come up here for a minute. So in front of this whole auditorium, I had these uh, 11 guys, and they're kind of looking around, what, what, what's, what's going on here? And so I said, I want you to embrace with me. I want to recreate this scene in Genesis 45. So we all had our... Uh, arm shoulder to shoulder, 12 of us. And I said, does anybody see anything in this? Anybody imagine what this is? And uh, uh, there's always one who sees it right away. These are the gates of the heavenly city. The gates, of the 12 gates, as John describes them uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 21, are named after these 12 brothers who had been so riven with division, but because of the forgiveness of Joseph and the good providence of God in saving them, in chapter 45, they are all embracing one another in full forgiveness. That's one of the very first pictures of heaven. You know, we're told by John that the gates are named for these 12 brothers. And it's at that point that they interlock. I think that um, uh, it's a beautiful picture of heaven and the forgiveness that we have. You know, these brothers had many, many quarrels and jealousies and uh, all kinds of issues. But at that moment, they are embracing one another in full forgiveness. And I think that's a preview of heaven, certainly. Another thing that's marvelous is that each of these gates, we're told, is a pearl. Remember that? We talk about the pearly gates of heaven. You remember, remember how we speak about that? And that too, I think, is significant because these gates tell us so much. Not only is it full forgiveness, but why pearl? Why, of all things, would these gates be pearl? And a pearl is uh, organic. It's not a mineral. 
It's organic. It comes from uh, God, God's wisdom in giving this little creature in the sea. It's an evidence of God's compassion toward a little creature in the sea that no one ever sees. But the oyster, a little particle of sand or a little piece of shell will get into that, that uh, shell and irritate its very sensitive membrane. You know this? And God has given that little creature the ability to secrete this uh, substance called necrete, which will cover that sharp piece of sand and make out of it a pearl. And uh, the pearl then is round, it's spherical, and so it doesn't irritate the skin of the oyster. It represents God's kindness. Why would God give that little creature that ability to overcome? What it represents is that which caused pain is no longer causing pain. Do you see that? And it leaves this artifact of this beautiful pearl. And I think that that's why these gates are called gates of pearl. Because when we go into those gates, what does that mean? We have left suffering behind. Do you follow me? And we have entered into a place where suffering is yet only a memory. I think it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful image of heaven. Um, the ark of God and the unveiled glory. And think of the tabernacle of David and David sitting there. This one thing, he says, he's looking at the ark. This one thing, he's asked of the Lord that he might see his beauty. That's a picture of heaven as well. When Joshua crosses the Jordan with Israel into the uh, land of promise and they receive their inheritance, to memorialize that crossing that God in faithfulness had given to the people, he has the elders of Israel gather 12 riverbed stones. Remember that? They pile up these riverbed stones by the Jordan at Gilgal to memorialize their safe passage. Well, Joshua is the one who is chosen to be the greatest type of Christ, I think, in the Bible, because our Lord himself, his name, as you know, is Yeshua, is Joshua. But at the end of Revelation, he gives 12 stones by the Crystal River, too, as a memorial that we have entered into the inheritance of God. <clears throat> but they are not riverbed stones. It's far greater. These are all precious jewels, 12 precious jewels that raise up this pyramidal city that represents that we have reached our heavenly home. It's just beautiful. He gives us this river of crystal waters. He recreates Eden for us. And those gates, as you approach that city, you can imagine the gates are lifted up. Remember the psalm, lift up your head, O ye gates. The gates are lifted up. It's an emblem of joy. Why? Because the Son of Glory, the King of Glory, is coming, is entering. The gates, we're told, John tells us those gates are never shut. What does it mean that these gates are never shut? Except that you, you would shut the gates at the approach of an enemy, but if these gates are never shut, then what does that mean? That there is never anything ever to threaten our peace. Isn't that wonderful? What a, what a joy that is. The uh, vision of Isaiah 54, when Jerusalem, uh, Isaiah gives the prophecy that Jerusalem will be destroyed by the Babylonians and the temple will be uh, decimated and taken down. Uh, God, through Isaiah, gives his people a word of comfort. Comfort ye my people. And he describes, your Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, but I'm going to give you a new Jerusalem. And he describes the, the walls of the city um, that are battlements of ruby and foundations of crystals. He begins to talk about the city as this jeweled city. And so there is the heart of God when the people of God are going through the darkest period, perhaps in all the history of redemption, when Jerusalem is destroyed and the people are taken back, back to where Abraham came from and they're back in bondage. So the work of Moses is undone. The work of Joshua is undone. The land is conquered by the uncircumcised. The work of David is undone. The city is taken. The walls are knocked down. The work of Solomon is destroyed. The temple is left in ruins. 
and the people are taken back to the east where they began. It's like God upheaves the whole history of redemption. 1,500 years, it's just unbelievable. It's just destroyed uh, because God will not work with an unclean and an unholy people. He, he will begin all over again. But it's in the context of that disaster of the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, 87, that God gives this beautiful vision of heaven to Isaiah, battlements of rubies, foundations of crystals. The Lord will build us a new city. It's when we go through the hardest times, it seems that God prophetically gives us the greatest visions of heaven. He describes, Ezekiel describes, the river flowing from the temple, which waters the tree of life. And he describes that river uh, beginning, a little rivulet that begins on the side of the temple and flows down and it becomes a stream and then it becomes a river, and it's up to the ankles, and then it's up to the knees. You remember that? And then it's up. It's a river that, that you can't ford. You have to, you know, and people, he says, boats are in it, and fishermen. It's looking to the gospel age. Where it's the first time we're called fishers of men uh, in the imagery there. And that river then takes the desert land that is parched and barren, and it fills it with abundance of waters and it refructifies the whole earth and transforms the wilderness into a garden. That river is a picture of heaven. And that, that little stream coming from the side of the temple in the prophetic vision of Ezekiel, it's not the temple in Jerusalem. It's the temple that is the body of Jesus because he is on the cross and they pierce his side with the spear and out comes the water and the blood. And that little rivulet becomes the great waters of baptism, all that reach now to all the earth, the vine that penetrates, that covers all the earth. He, we, are the, uh, we, are, we are the branches, we are the fruit, but we are in him, we're abiding in him and his waters of baptism are going into all the earth and taking that which was like a desert in the works of the flesh and replacing, replacing it in each of us. We are planted by those waters. We're being transformed by the Spirit of God so that what was once the works of the flesh is now love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. We're bearing good fruit. The whole world is being transformed by the saving work of Jesus. You remember Mary Magdalene in the, on the morning of the uh, resurrection. She comes bearing spices and tears. Uh, she's trying to imagine a world, living in a world without Jesus. Can you imagine such a thing? She's trying to come to terms with that. What would that be like to take that hope away? And she's living in that imagination that her Savior has been taken from her. And... She hears a voice behind her, and she imagines that the Lord is, is, she's looking for a corpse. They've taken away the Lord. She says, if, if you, she hears a voice, she assumes he's the gardener. If you've taken him away, let me know where you have laid him. See the posture of death. She doesn't imagine that the one who is standing behind her, the posture of life, could be her Lord. And so she's weeping, looking into the tomb, and then all of a sudden she hears her voice, Mary. You see, and her tears are gone. She doesn't need her, Jesus doesn't need her spices, and she has no need of tears. Her Lord is living and with her, and that, it, when, when John tells us, she assuming he is the gardener, that's not a throwaway line, because he truly is a new Adam, isn't he? And what he's done is he's restored the peace and harmony where God and man can walk together again in intimacy and fellowship. Jesus, on the morning of the resurrection, has restored the garden and all the privileges that we had once had uh, that had been uh, cast out because of our sin. You can think of Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above, uh, which is our mother, Paul tells us in Galatians 4. The ecumenicity of the city, Jesus said, um, in, uh, in the middle of Luke, he says, many will come from east and west uh, to sit at supper with Father Abraham. That's the, that's the middle of Luke. And he says, they will come from east and west, and the king of Nineveh, the north, will come. The queen of the south 
It's an ecumenical banquet with Father Abraham, and that's when the Pharisees resolve to kill Jesus when he has that fellowship table. Then the center of Acts demonstrates that because the center of Acts is the Jerusalem Council, and the whole issue there is, is um, um, will we have table fellowship with the Gentiles? And indeed we do. And what is our table fellowship? It's the communion of which we participate. Anyone who professes faith is welcomed at that table. It is magnificent. It's beautiful. Um, the ecumenicity of it, and when, when Jesus says to the disciples in Acts, uh, remain in Jerusalem, but you'll become my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost ends of the earth, then Luke, in his magnificent artistry, uh, describes how that is fulfilled. He has three road narratives. The roads are leading away from Jerusalem, don't you see? There's that famous road in Acts chapter 9, the road to Damascus. But in chapter 8, there's the road from Jer Jerusalem to Gaza. And in chapter 10, there's the road from Joppa to Caesarea. The roads are going away from Jerusalem. And on the first one, he describes, on each of these roads, there are three major conversions to faith. Three prominent men come to faith. The first one to come is the Ethiopian eunuch on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza in chapter 8. In chapter 9, uh, it is Saul of Tarsus who comes to faith on that road to Damascus. And then in chapter 10, as Pastor preached this morning, there is the road from Joppa to Caesarea that brings the gospel to Cornelius. And Luke, in his masterful artistry, has chosen these three men with a very deliberate purpose. An Ethiopian uh, eunuch, uh, Saul of Tarsus and Cornelius, uh, from the of, of, uh, centurion of Rome, they each of them represent the, the Ethiopian is a son of Ham. Uh, Paul, Saul, is a son of Shem, and Cornelius is a son of Japheth. So the nations that were scattered at Babel are now being brought back. The gospel is free for anyone who will come. It's a vision of heaven. All of the dynamics that lead, lead out now to bring the world back to the table of God. John's vision of heaven. Revelation 21-22, John focuses on things that are not there. And I think that fits very well with what Paul, when he says you can't describe it, it's beyond our ability to imagine. But we know there'll be no sea there and no night, and these are emblems of evil. There is no evil there. There's no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, no temple. Why is there no temple? Because the Lamb is there, and there are no veils. There we have immediate um, access to the presence of God. We don't need tabernacles and veils uh, to obscure his glory because there is nothing that defiles. Everything has been made sacred and holy. There is no curse there. Uh, and it's beautiful the way John ends the gospel. The climax, I think, in some ways, is Jesus saying to Mary uh, Magdalene, Woman, why are you weeping? That's at the very end, of course, as you know, of John's gospel. Then at the end of Revelation, he tells us, For God himself shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. I take that very seriously. I think every sorrow and hurt that we endure in this life will be fully explained. And we will see the glory that God brought out of that. He never gives us suffering without appending to it the glory that will follow. That's his heart, that's his nature. My uh, favorite worship leader uh, of all time is Dennis Jernigan. Some of you may uh, know of him, but anyway, he's very, very well known in the area of the country where I came from. And uh, at one point in an evening of worship, he said to uh, all of us, he said, think back to a time in your life when you thought God was nowhere around, but know that he was there feeling your pain. This is putting suffering together with glory. And in response, a woman wrote him this letter as he encouraged us to think about those times when 
when we thought that God wasn't with us. And we've all had times like that, haven't we? Where were you, Lord? And this woman wrote, the time I remembered was the stillborn birth of our first baby, Joshua John. My vivid memory of that day has always been the cold delivery room. I was alone. My husband was not allowed to be with me, no family in town. Only uncaring strangers shouting instructions at me. I was confused, cold, and afraid, and I remember the delivery and the doctors whisking away my baby and then overhearing them say that he was dead. For 15 years, that's how I remember that day. Yes, I did not think God was with me that day. However, thanks be to God, the Lord gave me a new picture through that worship time. I saw the same room and the same people, and yet this time, upon my delivery, I saw Jesus reach down and scoop up Joshua John in his arms. He held him lovingly, and he laughed, and he danced around the room, exclaiming, It's a boy. How proud he was of Joshua, and what tenderness and love he showed as he received him into his arms. How I thank God for this new picture, and how I thank him for loving me and Joshua and how grateful I am for the new healing in my heart. Heaven, it's here. I remember my beloved pastor of my childhood uh, talking about seeing uh, dead children in heaven, and that made me realize, I mean, it made me think we've had in our day this plague of abortion and yet the true matter is that one in five of our sisters in Christ has been there. For whatever reason, you know, maybe confusion, um, I don't think that's an easy choice for anyone. I can't imagine. And there may be confusion, there may be emergence, there may be all kinds of reason. I'm not, I'm not saying that it isn't wrong. But I'm saying this very boldly, that for those, those mothers who have lost their children, even in this manner, if they've come to know Christ, one day they will see those children again. And more than that, those children, like Proverbs 31 says, those children will rise up and call their mother blessed. That's heaven, when we see what God has done. Paul says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. The faithful apostle assures us of that. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that righteousness dwells there. That means there are no cycles of sin any longer. And we're, we're delivered from sin. Past sin is forgotten. It's interesting that with only one exception in the New Testament, when they talk about characters from the Old Testament, they forget, they never name the sin. There's one exception that I know of. But like Lot is called righteous. His righteous soul was vexed. I, that's, not, that's not the way I would describe, but I'm being taught something here. What's remaining, what's significant, is what God accomplished in the lives of these saints. And it's marvelous. Uh, it's wonderful. Jesus is our bridegroom. It's a dynamic of love. It's not static love. Do you understand that? In this world, we knew, and the first couple, Adam says of Eve, she is, just, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And that will be true of Jesus, but you will be not just bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, you will be blood of his very blood. That's the intimacy that you will have. Your, your eternal companion is an infinite God-man. He has to be infinite in order for us to have his presence. Do you realize Jesus will be your eternal companion? And he will be with you as though there is no one else immediately. We, all, we anticipate that if we think about it. All of us feel we pray to our Lord Jesus, don't we? And we know that he hears our prayer. If he were human, he couldn't do that. But he's not merely human. He's infinite. And so we will have his eternal companionship, all of us, 
as though he, there was no one else, as though he was with us always. And our asymptotic joy, I call it, we will always, because the glory of his being infinite and our being finite is we will always learn more about him. You see? And God has so made us that to learn more about him is to be thrilled and, and to, to be dazzled with his person and who he is. To know more about him is our greatest delight, and we will always be learning more about him without ever exhausting who he is. You see, that's why the joy of heaven, it's not static, it's always increasing and never exhausting because he's infinite. He will always, through all of the infinite ages of time, he will be delighting us and we will be growing in our joy as we learn more and more about him. The other thing that, too, the way that God has done it is that we will grow ever more like him, which means there is ever more beauty in us because he will delight in us as we become more like him. And this isn't, you don't reach a point here. It goes on forever. It's amazing. It's marvelous. I think Paul says that when he says he presents his bride to himself without any spot or wrinkle. You realize that's the reversal of the aging process. In this life, we go through life and beauty fades, but in heaven, it's exactly the opposite. Beauty is ever increasing, and joy in one another is ever increasing. And what the gifts that God has given to us as a community of faith, we are enriched the more people come to know our Savior. That, that, that is a joy that multiplies. Imagine... I think the gifts we have here anticipate are an intimation of heaven. Imagine what Bach has composed with celestial choirs, or Michelangelo with heavenly colors. Don't you think they're more vivid color? Perhaps that electromagnetic spectrum, that the visible light, what if it's broader? What if there's more visibility to that band? And what colors are hiding there? to be explored in the new world. We'd, what about Paul? Imagine what he would be able to tell us, expounding new mysteries. David, what psalms has he composed as he sees his full redemption? And Solomon, what new wisdom will he have to share with us? Augustine, exploring new dimensions of God's heart in the heavenly city of God. Athanasius, Aquinas, and Calvin open to us the new depths of divine truth. I've chosen these three deliberately. Athanasius is Eastern, Aquinas is Roman, and Calvin is Protestant. Our faith, the New Testament faith, the faith of Jesus is so rich. It has sustained all of these traditions, and there is a remnant of faith in all of them, and that's glorious to me. We will rule new worlds, endless ages of joy. Do you know the galaxies that God has made? Do you know this galaxy in which we find ourselves? It revolves. It's 104,000 light years to cross from one end of this galaxy to the other. 104,000 light years. Uh, roughly 100 million stars. And it's all rotating around a center. Do you know how long it takes for that rotation to take one galaxy year? 220 million years. Now, that is a clock. Do you realize that? That's a clock. Aristotle is there. Say, oh, Aristotle said, we measure time by the movement of the stars. Who would need a clock that has that kind of an expanse? What kind of a God are we dealing with? A clock that would measure 220 million years. And there are much larger galaxies. They're, they're now estimating instead of 100 million galaxies, most of what you see in the night sky are galaxies, you know that, not stars. Each one with 100 million stars. Instead of 100 million galaxies, they now say they're probably more like a trillion galaxies of stars. This is what God has done. By the way, Moses says he created the stars too, 
on the fourth day. That's his power. No wonder it's to encourage his, why does he do that? It's to encourage his people. Is his arm shortened, Isaiah says, that he cannot save? Come out, look at these stars. Or he says to Abraham, Abraham, like the, like your seed will be like these stars. Abraham, with a naked eye, can see about 8,000 stars. He has no idea, does he, what God means, really, in truth. It's marvelous the more you begin to understand this. Endless ages of time, boundless space. Uh, Immanuel Kant points out that we don't have minds that can conceive beyond space and time. That's just the way that our minds work. I can't tell you what's, what is before the beginning. Is there a time before the beginning? Or it, when we come to the ending, isn't there time after the ending? Then I can't conceive of time. And the same with space. What is it at the end of the universe? And what's beyond whatever is at the end of the universe? What could that possibly be? He's created this world, the heavens and the earth, with length and breadth and width and depth that we cannot plumb, we cannot imagine. Why? As a metaphor. So that Paul can say that we can't know the length and the breadth and the width and the depth of the love of Jesus for us. That's why the world has, that's why the universe has these dimensions. They're unfathomable. And that's to show the love of God for us. What a canvas of time and space, all of this made large enough to show the love of Jesus for us. The heavenly city, uh, Psalm 48, tells us to walk about Zion, go around her, consider her palaces and her talises, mark well her ramparts. He's, t he's commanding the people of God, inviting them to imagine the heavenly city like Paul will do. We, our forebears in the history of redemption, walked around Jericho, remember? Why did God have Israel parading around Jericho? Why did he do that? Remember, once a day for seven days and then seven times on the seventh day. Why go through all of that? He's showing the people that that city is impregnable. They can't take it. <laughs> They can't, they, can, there's, they have no siege equipment. They have no military force. They have no weaponry to speak of. And so here, here is the city walled up against God and his people with these mighty walls. He's showing them that they cannot take the city. And then what does he do? He gives it to them. He collapses the walls and gives it to them. And so contrary to that, the psalmist invites us to imagine heaven. Imagine the, the, the city and this, this is, if you think about this heavenly city, this glorious city, God made this world, I believe, in the space of six days. And, but the heavenly city, this world with all of its beauty in six days, but the heavenly city he has been preparing from the foundation of the world. Can you imagine what glory is there? He creates this city, he creates the world with his word, but the heavenly city, we're told, is created with the song of his heart. He's creating a place for you. You have no idea what that place, we have no idea what that place is like. He sings over that city. Isaiah 62, like the bridegroom over the bride, he sings over you. You are his bridal city. Zephaniah, the prophet, heard God singing over you. Is that how you understand who you are, how precious you are to him? When we were yet enemies with God, God gave his son. What then, Paul says, as he reasons, if God so loved us when we were enemies of God that he would give his perfect son, what will he not give us when we stand complete in the full righteousness of Christ himself? What will be the affections that we will know? This city, new foundations of precious jewels. There's a whole new physics there. He talks about streets of gold, but transparent like glass. I don't understand that. Uh, that doesn't fit with what I understand about this world. There is no need of the sun and the moon. They're merely decorative <laughs> because the lamb is the light. And the lamb is the emblem of redemption, so somehow this glorious city with all of its glittering jewels and gems 
You know, jewels have no light in themselves. They're nothing without light shining through. The light for the heavenly city is the Lamb. It is redemption. What kind of physics is that where redemption will be the power source that will make the, the illumination of the city of glory? I think it's wonderful, though. Always the light. And we derive our light from the light, from the Lamb, from his redemption, from an awareness of his redemption. It describes the fragrance of Jesus. New senses, where perhaps there are more than five. What new senses will we have that equip us for this new world in order to understand its beauty uh, and, and all of that? But one of the things that's marvelous is the fragrance of Jesus. There's so much made of that. The appeal to the senses, the joy, the one I, I love the most, I think, is the way it's described, the city. This is the city of the joy of his heart. Joy, the joy of the Lord. The light of the Lamb outblazing the dazzling sun. The reconciliations, uh, oh, there's so much anticipated here. Lot and Abraham, you remember the quarrel between the herdsmen? That, that they separated, they never dwelt together again. I mean, Abraham rescued Lot, but they never dwelt together. But 800 years later, God reconciled the quarrel when Ruth the Moabite married Boaz of Abraham. 800 years later, those quarrels were reconciled. It's marvelous. Joseph and his brothers, I've talked about that too. And what about this one? And this is marvelous. What was it like when David went to be with the Lord? Did you ever think about that? When David died at last and went to be with the Lord in heaven, one of the people there to meet him would be Uriah, the good Hittite. What do you say to a man whom you yourself murdered, although you were covenantly bound to him? What reconciliation can, you, can there be when you took his wife and robbed her of her purity and cut off his line? His, line, his name means the Lord is my light. He was a convert from the nations. He had taken circumcision, taken a Jewish name, was a good and godly man out would not, he would respect the right of holy war. What do you do? How does David meet Uriah? How can there be reconciliation of that? And Matthew is the one who explains it. How can David meet with Uriah? You see, when Matthew tells us his genealogy, he lists, you remember, Tamar and then Rahab, and Ruth, but he also says uh, uh, that David begat Solomon of her who had been the wife of Uriah. He suppresses the name of the mother so that he can say Bathsheba, we all know who she was, was the wife of Uriah. Do you know why he does that? He does that for this reason, and this is unbelievable. He said, what he does, you see, Uriah had no kinsman. He was a convert. There was no, no one. His line would be extinguished in Israel when he was cut off by David's cruelty. And so there's no one to carry on his name. He has no brothers to raise up seed in his name according to the Leveret Law. He has, his name will be completely extinguished, although he's a man of tremendous faith, faithfulness. There is only one who has a covenant relationship with Uriah. Only one in all of Israel. And that's after his repentance. That is David the king, who is covenantally married to all of his people. Only David could raise up a son in the name of Uriah, the Hittite, and preserve his line. And God uses David 
to raise up Solomon, who is the son of David, but according to Matthew, he is also the son of Uriah. And the house of David and the house of Uriah are reconciled because they are both brought into that family that will bring forth the Christ. Only God has an imagination like that. So when David met the good Uriah, they were reconciled in the love of the Savior who takes everything evil that we have done and makes it magnificently glorious. That is our Savior. That is, it's marvelous how he does that. Um, the uh, Jew and the Gentile, how can you reconcile that quarrel? Have you looked at the Gentiles in Jesus' lineage? I remember uh, Deuteronomy 23 always troubled me. Someone who's emasculated or an Ammonite, a Moabite, can't enter the sanctuary of God. Why would God keep away those who are disabled? And then I realized, you know why he does that? They can long for a better temple. And Jesus comes, who's a better temple. Do you know Jesus, for the sake of the kingdom of God, made himself a eunuch, didn't he? And through, uh, through Ruth, his ancestress, he was descended from a Moabite and from Rehoboam. He was descended from Rehoboam's mother, who was an Ammonite. The Lord Jesus is bringing all of these who had been alienated to himself. Uh, there's so much to go on here, but um, hopefully this will encourage your hearts a little bit in the hope that we have in heaven before us. Father, we thank you. We cannot begin to imagine the glory of the city that you have set before us because we are the price of your own blood. And we are the redemption of your heart. So I thank you for these sweet people. I pray that you would use our time together to encourage them. The grand story of redemption that we are all participating in. Oh, Lord, bless their, bless their imaginations. I expand our capacities to understand how so very much you have loved us, even from the foundations of the world and all of eternity will be the exposition of your love to us. We thank you for this amazing, amazing gospel and the story of the Bible. Amen.